Good morning, Tomlin Middle School art classes. Hope you had a great weekend. It was really fun seeing a lot of you guys during our Zoom chat last Friday for our lunch doodle sessions. I'm hoping to do those every Friday uh, as a lot of my students have recommended to have them. Uh, they said they had a really lot, a lot of fun. Um, today, I'm going to be doing a historical lecture on all of your different types of art projects. Now, I know a lot of you guys are like, ugh, art, history, gross. But think of it as a way to provide uh, different visual points for your projects. Now, each genre of art, as well as each time frame of artistry, provides a different way in which your art could be created. We'll go over a lot of those different ways in the historical session that I have provided soon. So hold your seats. We got a fun class today. I also want to say thank you to Reagan for providing some of my uh, inspirational imagery for uh, my journal posts. Uh, it's always good to see students involving themselves in the classes like that. Uh, please, if you have anything to contribute as far as inspirational images or hand-drawn pictures or anything like that that you want me to share, just send them to me in my direct message through Edsby or my personal email, and I'll be sure to add them into all of the different uh, journal entries that we do. So thank you, Reagan. Appreciate it. Good morning students and thank you for joining me in my historical library. I got my fireplace roaring right now. And I wanted to bring up for my 2D1 students our landscape drawings that we'll be conducting soon. So I wanted to give you a brief history of landscape perspective and all the time frames from 4th century CE China all the way up to the modern time and how the landscapes have changed as far as their perspective over time. Now, as I mentioned earlier, not only is this a historical lesson, but it's also a lesson about how you can do your own landscape at home. Are you going to use mythical ideas? Are you going to use realistic ideas? Are you going to use metaphorical ideas? And so all of these different depictions will help you guide your way as you create your newest perspective landscape design. So, Without any further ado, let me get into the historical lecture. Now, landscape painting is the depiction of a natural scenery in art. Now, although paintings from the earliest ancient and classic periods include natural scenes and elements, landscapes as an independent genre was not considered a form of subject matter until about the 16th century. However, in the Eastern tradition, the genre could be tracked back to about 14 century CE in China, which are very similar to the images that you guys created, or some of you guys created, with Mr. Edgman, which were India ink on silk, similar to this image here. Now before the 15th century, landscape pa paintings were not considered a refined form of subject matter. Now what I mean by subject matter is it's the main focus, focus point of the image. It wasn't like, let's go outside and draw this pretty tree. That wasn't the point of it. They were using, more than often, biblical or mythical images in, in company with uh, the landscape. The landscape was secondary to the image itself, similar to this picture painted by George Owen, which is called the Adoration of Shepherds. By the 16th century, artists in Northern Europe were creating paintings which often populated biblical features still. However, like this Flemish artist named Peter Bruegel, he became a master of landscape painting, specializing in very colorful and highly detailed scenes, which is like this one named The Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. By the 17th century, ushered in a new classical or ideal landscape now, French-born, Italian-based Nicolas Poussin, who is attempting to catch a more metaphorical meaning in the natural elements of their paintings. By depicting mythological or biblical stories to set in an elaborate natural setting, this Dutch artist of that period infused the elements of their composition with metaphorical meaning and made us 
use the visual impact of small figures in a vast landscape to express ideas on humanity and its relationship to the almighty nature. So basically, the frame has gotten bigger, but the subjects have gotten smaller to show the relationship between subjects and their surrounding area, similar to this image called Landscape with a Calm by Nicholas Poussin. Now the center of landscape painting during the 18th century, another 100 years later, was called the Rococo period. Now that shifted from Italy down to the Netherlands and England and France. Now French painters like Antoine Watteau, who is a romantic outdoor painter, painted scenes with precise detail and delicate color. It glorified nature. Their light-hearted landscapes were decorative and filled with beautifully dressed men and women who enjoyed the amusements of the outdoor leisurely style, similar to this image here. An additional 100 years later, now we are in the 19th century, and we embrace a wide-reaching romantic movement and influence their compositions with passion and drama. In England, two of the foremost landscape painters were John Constable and J.M.W. Turner. Both artists worked at a grand, large scale to express power of nature. They both were masters capturing on canvas the atmospheric qualities of the weather. And Constable, however, worked in a realistic mode with a high level of precision in his landscapes of the English countryside similar to this image called Salisbury Cathedral from Lower March in 1820. Now across the great pond of the Atlantic Ocean, here in the Western world, we had just started making paintings of landscapes. It originated in the United States by the Hudson River School, the same river that Lewis and Clark traveled up during their greatest expedition. Now painters were centered on the Hudson River Valley, which is found in New York. In paintings like Catskill Mountains, an artist captured dramatic effects of light and shade in fine detail of subject matter and celebrated the unique build, uh, beauty of still untouched areas of the American landscape, similar to this beautiful image by Thomas Cole in 1844 called A View of the Two Lake Mountains House. Now, the invention of the tin tube for paint was invented in 1841. The invention was also paired with a collapsible easel, which in the mid-19th century revolutionized the landscape genre by allowing artists to venture out of the studio and study painting with their subjects firsthand. Outdoor painting became dominant practice in the Impressionist painters by the late of the 19th century. With those additional freedoms that were afforded by the newly invented tools, the Impressionists, like my favorite book here, moved away from the romantic styles of realistic renderings and biblical styles of landscape paintings, favoring more subjects uh, with a form of expression. Artists such as Claude Monet and Perrier Renoir, my favorites, worked outdoors in what's called in plein air and recorded and paint the effects of light and weather. Their sketchy application of paint and visible brush strokes is a very beautiful use of color and was groundbreaking in the influential generations of artists in future times. Very similar to this image here by Renoir himself. Now some of my students have already been influenced by the surrealistic movement for example, Salvador Dali, and a few other ones that Mr. Edgman had already pointed out. However, I just wanted to bring up that those landscapes are also considered a big portion of landscape paintings. So what they would do is they would take unexpected differences between two different things. They would contrast the natural and the imaginary world together. One of the most famous paintings that show this is the persistence of memory by Dahl with the melting clocks. Now by the 20th century, considered the modernist forms of painting, American painters such as George O'Keeffe took into landscape painting and traveled throughout the United States and beyond to paint in that very style. 
The urban landscape or cityscape also took predominant place in the modernist practice, similar to this image by George O'Keefe with these beautiful purple and blue mountain sets among a riverbed. Now by the 20th century, the mid 20th century, artists such as Richard Dybenkorn, as well as Helen Frankenthaler, among many others, embraced this freedom of abstraction at this point, transforming the use of line, color, and form as the last remaining fragments or pieces of traditional landscapes into a mere suggestion of the natural and built world around us. Very similar to this image by Richard Dybenkorn. Thank you guys for watching. See you soon. deception of, I'm sorry, start over, ephemeral art. Now ephemeral oh. interruptions. Fire rolling here, or roaring here, or rolling with a roar, or